Good evening. My name is John Milburn. I'm the Unit Coordinator for Laws 13010, Evidence and Proof, and this is Term 1, 2018. Welcome to the unit. I'm very pleased that you've um, selected this unit and you're joining us in this term. We have a couple of people online. Um, we do hope that we can have more people online in future uh, offerings of this um, unit. Uh, so we meet every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Queensland time, and the link is via Moodle to Zoom. The um, Moodle site is developed in a particular way, which I try to keep as simple as possible. And um, I guess two of the highlights that I want to raise with you at the start are the links to the Zoom sessions. Thank you, Vivian and Tegan, for finding those links and joining us live tonight, and um, also you, crew. I'm going to share the screen, and I'm going to ask if you just tell me if I select the right screen. What you should see is the Moodle page for evidence and proof. Is that what's coming up on the screen? All right. So um, just a few things about the way in which I set out the Moodle page. If you haven't worked with me in the past, it might be a little different to the way you're used to with other unit coordinators. If you've worked with me in the past, it would hopefully seem quite familiar. So on the landing page, as I describe it, under my photo is my contact details. Generally, I would encourage you to contact me via uCrew. By all means, feel free to send me a direct email if you wish, but don't be surprised if when you do send me an email, I provide a response, perhaps an answer to a question, and then invite you to re-ask that question on uCrew. The reason for that is that I want everyone to share in the information and to exchange information. And it may be that if you ask a question, one of your colleagues or more of your colleagues may be able to answer the question just as well, if not better than I can, or at least put a different perspective or provide different material for you to consider. And speaking of material on uCrew, I encourage you to introduce material yourself. In other words, this is an interactive class. It's not me feeding information to you. It's not me prescribing everything that needs to be read or considered. So if you find something that is of value to you, please share it with your colleagues um, because odds are they will find it valuable also. In many ways, the way in which we teach generally at Central Queensland University is to adopt a flipped classroom model. And that means that while we provide many of the resources and guidance necessary, we expect you to engage in the learning process proactively. And that means being creative in the way in which you do things. So sharing material through you crew, asking questions and sharing information and answers is a vital part of that. For those of you that have not used you crew with me in the past, it might seem very strange. And the first thing that you'll notice is that there is no link to questions and answers or assessment forums in on the Moodle page. And people will be looking for that if that's what you're used to. So if you're used to posting a question or posting some material on Moodle through Q&A or an assessment forum or some other forum, basically think uCrew. So uCrew is being remodeled at the moment and you'll see the link for uCrew here on the landing page. It is a URL. Usually we um, have an external tool link, but now it's a URL and that should take you directly to the landing page in uCrew for this subject. Now, having said that, prior to recording, uh, Vivian um, uh, confirmed that uh, as recently as this afternoon, there was a note saying that uCrew is being upgraded. Um, I did meet with my uh, colleague and representative from the United States, from, U from uCrew, Nils um, Naziri, and uh, I'll raise that with her, with her as well. I'll provide you with um, Nils's direct contact details, or you can contact support at uCrew for information. But if you do contact Nils with a problem, a question, um, or an issue regarding uCrew, please CC me in on it so that I can then engage in the process as well. So we do want that to work. Um, I certainly have access to uCrew via this direct link. It should work, but I will check it out and please let me know if there are ongoing issues. And thank you, Vivian, for bringing that to my attention. So below the, re the link to uCrew, we have the link to the um, weekly sessions. So this is the first of them. And um, 
correct me if I'm wrong, Vivian and Tegan, but it would have just been a case of you clicking on that link in order to join the session tonight. Was, was it as simple as that for you? Okay. So um, you may have previously downloaded the Zoom app. Um, I'm not sure if you still need to do that. I recommend people do. Um, in fact, I say you need to, but it's really a simple process. So if you're watching this recorded session and you think, oh, it's all too hard to join live, uh, it's not really, and we'd encourage you to do that. So let's um, go back to the Moodle page, sharing the screen. Some of the other things that you'll notice is, in terms of the assessment regime, there are links to the first two assessments in two places. The first is below latest information, there is a link to assessments and individual links to three types of assessment. That's mirrored, if you like, in the top left hand assessment block, top left hand, top left -hand corner of Moodle. <clears throat> and uh, you should be able to find the first two assessments are already uploaded. So if you haven't had a look at the assessment regime, please do so. A couple of things, um, the assessments for me on the 19th of April and the 17th of May are due on Thursdays. That's pretty typical for me. I make most of my assessments due by 11.45 p.m. on a Thursday evening. Please submit your work on time. If you can't, then there is a penalty of 5% per annum sorry, five per annum, per day uh, for every day of late submission. And there is a cutoff, which is typically the Saturday week, nine days after the assessment. Having said that, there is an exception to that general rule that I have for the first assessment. And that's really because of the nature of the assessment, which is a cross-examination cross or an examination in chief assessment. I've, I'm, going to re, I'm going to reword that. I've called it cross-examination assessment. That's a misnomer. It is, in fact, a combination of examination in chief and cross-examination. When you read the assessment, you'll see the theory is quite simple. What you're required to do is form groups of two people. Now, you're not working as team members. It's an individual assessment. But we work in teams of two. What happens is that on or before the 19th of April, and I'm a bit flexible about this one, you'll book in a time to, make, um, to, to meet with me on Zoom. So it will just be the three of us. I'll record the session, but I won't upload it to, to um, YouTube. <clears throat> we'll keep it just in case there is an issue in terms of um, uh, reassessment of the grade, which is pretty rare with me. If at all, like I'm not sure I can ever remember having a reassessment request. But um, you will, with your, with your colleague, involve yourself in either asking me questions as the prosecutor, which is examination in chief, or as defence counsel, which will be cross-examination. And I'll grade you individually on your performance. Now... I'll leave it for you to decide whether you want to be the prosecutor to question me in examination in chief or whether you wish to be the defence counsel and cross-examine me. There is no advantage one way or the other. And really, while people might think that one is more difficult than the other, my view is that they are both equally challenging. So you will find someone that you're happy to work with and you'll let me know who your colleague is that you're working with and we'll book in a time. I'll put something on the, the, the landing page of Moodle and in Ucrew to help you both to find a partner and book in a time um, for that assessment. We'll talk more about that and the role of what uh, you need to do in examining or cross-examining the witness will become more obvious as we proceed but it's there already. So the assessment, the assessment task requires you to examine and cross-examine a witness, Xavier Kelly, played by me, in relation to a charge of robbery where Scott Drysdale and Simon Bancroft have been charged with robbery 
on the 11th of November 2017. The allegation being that they stole a quantity of cash and cigarettes and at the time the defendants used or threatened to use actual violence to a person. So the prosecutor will examine the witness, the defence counsel will cross-examine the witness and will do that task within a window of 30 minutes. If there are any questions about that, please feel free to ask now, either Vivian or Tegan, um, or ask through Ucrew. And if you want, you can send me an email to that effect. So conceptually, that task is pretty simple and it's meant to be fun. I'm keen for you not to stress too much about that task because at such an early stage in the unit, I don't expect that you'll know all of the intricacies of evidence law. How could you? We wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have finished the unit at that stage. But I will expect you to do a few things. The first is to make sure that you participate, obviously. Second is to give it a good shot. Now, giving it a good shot means you'll need to be confident, it's not brash, but you'll need to be confident. And the way in which you present a little bit, in terms of the way in which you present, in terms of dress, etc., cetera, is, is part of it. But the way in which you use your voice, the mode in which you ask questions, the clarity of the question, the way in which you um, try to tease out information is all part of the exercise. This is not an exercise where I want you to challenge or object to any questions raised by your colleague. So you're not, while you're silent, while your colleague is working, you're not being tested. So there's no point objecting and saying, I object to that question um, for whatever reason, leading question, whatever it might be. So just let your colleague go and then you'll have your turn or vice versa, as the case may be. Some guidance in relation to that preparing for the first assessment is, prepare some questions in advance in fact, you need to do that. As part of the assessment, I require you to prepare a, a list of questions. Um, I ask for 10 or 20 questions. You might prepare many more than that, but upload 10 or 20 um, and maybe keep some in reserve. And when you upload those questions, um, I will be able to get a feel for where you're going with the witness and um, on your, and you will slant on this. Okay, so when you're asking a question, a few basic rules. And we're really getting down to the to the uh, nitty gritty of evidence and proof towards the end, you know, as it were, the end of the course, and we're working backwards. So, when you're asking questions, keep one concept or question at a time. So, no double-barreled question questions. What do I mean by a double-barreled question? So, for example, if you're cross-examining and you say, well, when you saw the red car, it was speeding, wasn't it? That's fine if it's already been established what this red car was. But if nobody has previously established the existence of a red car as being relevant to this case, what you're really doing is asking a double-barreled question. You're asking, was there a red car somehow involved in this incident? And secondly, was the driver of that red car speeding? Do you see how that's double barreled? And what you're doing is you're tossing something in which might be presumed or you think is relevant, but you need to establish that on the facts. So golden rule, if you're asking questions, keep them short, because if you keep them short, you're likely not to fall into the trap of asking double barreled questions. There are a few other things. You know, we do ask people to um, write, in the active voice. If you've worked with me in the past, you'll know that I'm always on about the active voice or the passive voice. So look at asking questions in the active voice and keep them simple. Okay, so after this session tonight, if you haven't already done so, have a look at that statement of Xavier Kelly. Ask yourself, what are the questions that I would ask that witness if I was prosecuting what are the questions I would ask that witness if I was defence counsel? And start to create a list. There's nothing wrong with having two lists and uh, that way you can go either way, defence or prosecution.
and it's a good exercise. It might actually help you if your defence counsel to have written the questions as if you're the prosecutor and vice versa. Okay, I know there's only two of you online, so I won't pick on you, but do you, Vivian or Tegan, do you have any questions about that first assessment at this stage? All good? All right. So the second assessment is also due on a Thursday. I'll share the screen once again. You can probably tell from me doing this that I do actually follow through with something that I talk about to students in introduction in, to law particularly, and that is the importance of working backwards, knowing what the end objective is that you wish to achieve, and then working out a plan to get there. So it seems to me perfectly sensible to talk about the assessment regime at the start and then work backwards from there. And we plan our, our, our studies. The second is what we call an experiential assessment. It's due on the 17th of May. It's a bit of fun. You have an opportunity to watch a movie, classic, witness for the prosecution. Um, sorry, you'll have to try and source it. If you can't, uh, let me know. We'll sort something out. But most people are able to source it um, one way or the other, if I can use that term. So we have two questions and your job is to answer those questions. This is a written assessment and you need to um, upload your response to those questions in a single word document in the usual manner through Moodle. Looking at my page, it says view all submissions. I, I suspect that your page says upload your submission. Okay, so the second assessment task, um, why not try to source that movie now so that there's not a last minute rush? And maybe watch it a few times. As you watch it, I would make a note of every time there's an objection and perhaps make a note of the time in the movie uh, so that you can easily reference that if you need to go back to it at a later time. So your job is to provide some uh, information and critique, if you like, about those, um, those two tasks. Uh, so it's worth 30%. Now the final assessment is an invigilated examination. It's worth 40%. Um, it will be in the examination block. I don't know the date of the invigilated examination, but it will be at an examination centre and um, it is not a, um, an, an online examination in any sense. It's uh, paper and pen, albeit that it is open book, but no access to the internet. Okay, so that's a flying overview of the assessment regime. Let's go back to the Moodle page, just a few other things that I want to bring to your attention. The first is that from time to time, I will provide, if you like, announcements, and I'll do that in two ways. One is I'll provide some statement or link to um, a video. Um, for example, this video, will, I will upload and provide a link in information. I'll also provide the same uh, video, a link in week one, because the information page will change regularly and uh, I will put material there and then remove it. Uh, so keep an eye on that page quite regularly. Other than that, um, you'll see each week is quite neatly set out and within the week you'll find materials for you to consider. Dr. Anthony Maranak has developed some excellent lectures. Um, I couldn't do better. So those lectures are there for you to review as is the study guide, further accepts and the problems. Now I'd recommend that you look at those problems and answer the problems. You do that through Moodle. It's one of the exceptions to the rule that communications are through UCRU. So upload your response to the problems. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that it might prompt people to discuss the answers. It might encourage some lat lateral thinking. And also if you have your response there, uh, then you can claim if you like, ownership of that response, you know, because copyright is developed automatically as a result of authoring something. So if you provide the response, it's your response. And if people like it, and it happens to be that one of these problems is an examination question, for example, 
then they're going to have to cite you as the source for the excellent answer that you provided. So there's some good reasons, I think, to answer those weekly problems. Um, so I'd encourage you to do so. Okay, so that's the Moodle site. Um, and you'll see that um, uh, each week I will upload the, um, this session, this Wednesday night session, as well as the material that is already there. I think that's all I wanted to bring to your attention uh, at this stage. Okay, so that's the Moodle site. I'll just stop the share now. And for those of you that have worked in the, uh, with me in the past, a lot of that would have been pretty basic. Okay, so what's the aim of evidence? This course is evidence and proof. Um, the, evidence, the aim of evidence is to use relevant and admissible material evidence to prove a material fact. So what we want to do is break that down a bit. One of the best ways to contrast what we mean by evidence as opposed to something else is to look at other things that might be, that people might regard as evidence, but it's not really evidence. Put it this way, if you're involved in some sort of dispute, and we've done this all our lives, sometimes we try to argue our case and we rely on evidence to do so. So in the schoolyard, we may have been involved in some issue that required us to plead our case in front of a teacher or a parent or another student or whatever it might have been. What did we do in order to convince that person that we were dealing with that our version of events was correct? We would, we would look at the facts or we'd, look at, we'd provide information to the decision maker to say, this is why you should decide things and this, this is in my way. We'd provide that information. Now, sometimes the information provided was not really evidence, as we like to think of it, in law, but it was information nevertheless. Um, it might have been that part of your argument is, I am right because the other person is a liar and everybody in the classroom knows that he or she is a liar. So therefore, that proves that I'm right because I'm dealing with a liar. You see... That sort of thing is what people believe you can bring to court. And they might, if you're up unrepresented, plead their case by saying, well, of course I am innocent of the charge because the person who has accused me of, charge, uh, of this charge is a well-known liar, Your Honour. Ask anybody at the workplace and they will tell you that he or she lies all the time that's not likely to get you very far in terms of the evidence that you produce in a courtroom. It's information, but it's not evidence. Evidence has to be relevant, but it has to be admissible. And that's what we're really talking about now. So what's the proof side of things? Well, the proof is to mount a case to persuade a finder of fact, but we have to do that using evidence. So what do I mean by information as opposed to evidence. Well, let's have a look at the Oxford Dictionary. The Oxford Dictionary says, in terms of information, its meaning is facts provided or learned about something or someone, what is conveyed or represented by a particular arrangement or sequence of things. That's pretty broad. That doesn't really help as much, does it? Evidence, information is not evidence but evidence is information, if that makes sense. Let's draw another issue as to why, at law, information is not always evidence. Uh, let's talk about political, as uh, the political scene. So a prime minister, for example, may have to deal with negative polls. Those polls are opinions, aren't they? Now. The polls are a combination of funny combination of fact and opinion because the existence of the poll and the results of the poll is a fact, but it's based on people's opinions. So sometimes information is this hybrid of opinion and fact 
or maybe both. But rarely does someone's opinion form admissible evidence, can do sometimes. Usually, admissible evidence relates to some sort of fact. Do you understand the difference between the two? Okay, so in other words, if you are arguing in a court case that something is likely correct, you can't raise issues of someone's opinions, as I talked about before, the opinion of people in the workplace, and present it as a fact. That won't work in court. It may be very relevant for politicians, but it's not going to be relevant in a court. So what is relevant? What is something that we need to put before a court that will be considered by the court but taken into account by the court. We know that it's not just everything. We can't just say whatever we like. It's not a free for all. It has to be something which is firstly relevant. In other words, if you're arguing, arguing a case and you want to put forward as a fact that everybody in the workplace thinks that somebody is a liar, and the court is likely to say, not interested in that opinion evidence. Under our rules of evidence, that's not relevant. And if it's not relevant, it won't be admissible. But sometimes things that are relevant are still not admissible. So, for example, a person's criminal history you might think is highly relevant, but it's not necessarily going to be admissible. In other words, there are rules that say, not all relevant information is going to be admitted. Even if it's factual, it's still not necessarily under our rules going to be admitted as evidence. Now let's take that one step further and say, something is relevant and something is admissible and it makes it way it makes its way into evidence that's not the end of the story because then we get to the proof side of things so relevance and admissibility really deal with that threshold question of is it going to find its way into court is it going to be considered by the finder of fact if it is we then talk about the proof side of things and one of the key preliminary points is, well, is it reliable? Does it really prove anything? And this is where defence lawyers have a great time because when it comes to the argument of reliability, defence lawyers want to pick holes in the evidence which is presented. Even though it's relevant, even though it's admitted as evidence, the defence lawyers will argue it's not reliable. It's not reliable for the finder of fact to take that evidence into account in making its decision. So in front of a jury, the defence counsel will be arguing that you can't take into account the, eye, the, the, the evidence of an eyewitness because it was dark. How, could the, how can you consider that evidence as reliable when it was dark and they couldn't possibly have seen? How can you consider the evidence of the eyewitness when that person by their own admission was not wearing glasses and they need glasses in order to see in, a, in the distance? How is it reliable to rely on the evidence of an eyewitness who saw an event but did so fleetingly in a fraction of a second? How can you argue that something is reliable if an eyewitness says, I saw this event but it was many, many years ago, or I was intoxicated at the time, or I was distracted try while trying to care for children, or I was upset because some other event had occurred. So you can see that when it comes to the proof side of things, even though the evidence might be in as part of the case, it may be subject to a question mark as to whether in fact it is reliable. And that leads me to the, the, the next final point uh, in this part, which is probative value. So if something is relevant 
and if something is admitted into evidence, and if it's regarded as reliable, and its reliability has not been successfully attacked, there is finally, and this is really the fourth part of things, the, we'll describe it as the so what factor. What does it actually prove? So if we have a situation where someone is charged with grievous bodily harm, and an eyewitness says that the perpetrator of the crime was wearing a plain white t-shirt, let's just say, um, and the um, evidence which is produced by a witness is to the effect that they have seen the wardrobe of the accused and the accused does have a plain white t-shirt in his or her wardrobe. Defence counsel is likely to say, okay, that might be relevant, it might be admissible, that witness might be reliable, but so what? Thousands, millions of people, even in Australia, have a plain white t-shirt in their wardrobe. So does that really, does that evidence really carry any probative value? Or is there the, well, so what factor? Do you understand what I mean? Okay, so the acronym that I want you to consider is this. R for relevance, A for admissibility, R for reliability, and P for probative value. I mean, you're familiar with the old IRAC acronym that we've used throughout your law degree? Issues, rules, application, and conclusion. Well, really evidence is it's sort of at that A stage, isn't it? We're really, we're dealing with rules, but we're kind of applying those rules. So relevance, admissibility, reliability, probative value, forms a subset of application within the context of evidence law. And I think the first two, relevance and admissibility, relate to getting something into evidence. And that's kind of more the evidence side of things. And then the reliability and probative value is dealing more with the proof side of things. Okay, it's into evidence, but what does it actually prove? Do you understand? So, Sometimes information may be fact or it may be opinion. This is all part of the subset of, subset of information, but it won't necessarily be admitted into evidence um, because we have a lot of rules. Okay, so what are these rules that I'm talking about? If we um, think about evidence law, the first thing that I want you to, to bear in mind is that there are some distinctions. In fact, quite a lot of distinctions. And those distinctions will depend on whether we're talking about common law or statute law, whether we're talking about Queensland law or Commonwealth law, and even within, say, the Queensland jurisdiction, what type of court or tribunal are we considering? Because different rules of evidence apply for those different jurisdictions. So what I'd like you to consider doing is this. Those of you that have worked with me or perhaps others in um, introduction to law or statutory interpretation will know that I'm very keen for you to build a toolkit. I think toolkits are really useful and they're very personal to you. So when you're doing your reading, when you're, when you're considering any of the material that's presented to you, try to work in a toolkit that works for you. I'm not going to present you with a toolkit, but do something that works for you. So one of the things that you might want to do in your toolkit is list acronyms that work for you. And you think, okay, I can understand that. Maybe it will be building in some dictionaries. Okay, what do we mean by information? What do we mean by facts? What do we mean by opinions? What do we mean by relevance, admissibility, reliability, probative value? And work out a little dictionary for yourself. And then maybe try and work some flow charts. Um, and it might be that, that you have a large square which, or circle that you call information. And then you might say, all right, well, facts are part of the information. Opinion is part of information, you know, news poll. So maybe I'll split information into two and I'll call it facts and I'll call it uh, opinion. Then within the context of facts, 
we have those things that are relevant and then within the context of that some of it is admissible and then we have these other issues of proof reliability and probative value okay so start working on your toolkit in a way that makes sense for you that you can use and refer to in an examination type situation or if you're going to practice in this field that you can use while you're on your feet during the course of a, a trial for example so i've mentioned that in evidence law we need to consider common law which is cases we need to consider statute law both in queensland and common law well the common law is going to apply basically across the jurisdictions of both Queensland and Commonwealth jurisdictions. But in terms of the statute law, we have different statutes regarding evidence in Queensland to many other parts of uh, Australia and the Commonwealth. So in Queensland, this will come as no surprise, what you need to do is consider the Evidence Act 1977. It's not huge. You can see I've got the, the bound version um, but it's uh, readily available online and start to work your way through that and extract information that you believe is relevant. You know, let's go back to statutory interpretation principles. When you look at a new piece of legislation, what do you do? What's the first step? Feel free to answer. I think it's a matter of looking at the headings, isn't it? And you can see I've highlighted the headings. So have a look at the headings and that will help to guide you through the process. Look at the subheadings and get a feel for it. <laughs> what you'll find is that when you look at the Evidence Act, most of it relates to exceptions to the general rule. And hearsay is a huge part of this unit. So we'll get to know hearsay, 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 exceptions to hearsay, exceptions to hearsay. We'll talk about that a lot. Now contrast that Evidence Act of 1977 with the Evidence Act 1995. That's the Commonwealth version. We have another name for this. We call it the Uniform Evidence Act. We call it Uniform Evidence Act because it's uniform to the Commonwealth and many states of Australia, not Queensland. So if you were studying evidence in other states, all you'd have to do is worry about this piece of legislation. You wouldn't have to worry about the second one. Sorry, but here we're going to work too. Yeah, sorry, Tegan. Sorry, can I ask why that is? Like, is there a plan for that to change in the future, or are we going to stick with our own? Make it harder for us. Oh, uh, I, I know this is being recorded on YouTube. Um, I, look, let me say this: I think it's essentially political, and. You're probably aware I'm a practicing barrister, so I'm a member of the Bar Association of Queensland. And I hope the Bar Association of Queensland doesn't mind me saying, they probably will, but I hope they don't mind me saying, that I think in many ways, the fact that we have our own Evidence Act is as a result of influence from the Bar Association, which is essentially saying, we think it works best in Queensland to have the old Act, and we think it's better than going to the Uniform Evidence Act. There's no particular right or wrong reason for it other than for whatever reason the Queensland Government has elected not to, to make the change and we are still with the 1977 Act. My personal view is that one day it will change but it hasn't yet and as far as I'm aware there's no current move for it to do so. But That's a really good question Tegan. Thank you. All right so but the bad news is you've now got two pieces of legislation to work with, primary pieces of legislation. And in addition to that, you need to work out the common law. Now we all know, of course, that the common law will uh, be subject to the statutory rules, which will override the Commonwealth law, the common law. Here's a tip for you for the assessments and the exam. And I really need you to pay attention to this. Be careful to ensure that you cite the correct act. In other words, if we're dealing with a Queensland case, for example, a Queensland crime, grievous bodily harm, the matter being dealt with in the Queensland courts, then the Evidence Act Queensland applies 
To what extent will the court consider the Commonwealth Uniform Evidence Act? Pretty much not at all. There might be some case law decided under this Act that has a bearing on the interpretation of this Act, but basically the Queensland courts in its state jurisdiction will be looking at the Queensland Evidence Act, so please don't cite for me a section in this Act as if it has any effect uh, on the Queensland legislation. Likewise, if you're dealing with a case in Queensland that is based on Commonwealth law, don't cite the Queensland Evidence Act, cite the Uniform Evidence Act. So examples of that would be things to do with family law, bankruptcy, matters that are dealt with in the federal court, uh, the federal circuit court, etc. They're all issues for the Commonwealth Uniform Evidence Act. The next thing you need to consider are ethical issues. So throughout the unit, we'll be talking about ethical issues in the application of evidence law. Mostly that applies in relation to cross-examination, but it can apply in examination in chief as well. We'll be talking about issues to do with analysis of body of evidence and the admissibility and probity value. We've already talked about that. And now you should know where admissibility fits in and you should know where probity value fits in. On that list of four acronyms, that's number two and number four. We'll be talking about cases, statutory sources, and using creative thinking to um, come up with some solutions. Another tip, when you're dealing with the examination, just bear in mind um, from introduction to law days that the way in which the question is asked will have a direct bearing on the way in which you should answer it. And I'll, give, I'll be more specific than that. So if the question asks you to interpret something, that means interpretation means determining the material facts. That's what I'm after. If I ask you to analyze something, what I'm really looking for is your ability to identify hidden features. If I ask you to evaluate, it means assess something. If I ask you to infer, or draw an inference, I mean, I'm looking for you to draw conclusions. If I'm asking for an explanation, it's your ability to communicate something, um, a result, and self-regulation means applying your own thinking to the uh, tasks. So keep that in mind. All right, Vivian, you're being very patient. Thank you very much for staying with me. Um, in relation to the evidence law, Oh, Tegan's back. Uh, thank you, Tegan. Thank you, Tegan. Sorry, it dropped out. <laughs> no, that's, that's good. Thank you for coming back. All right, so what we need to do is consider another distinction, and that is evidence law as opposed to evidence procedure. And when it comes to procedure, we'll mostly be talking about the Uniform Civil Procedure Rules and the Criminal Law Practice Rules. That's in Queensland. Um, Otherwise, there'll be, um, uh, it'll be the, the, the federal uh, rules. But when you're talking about both evidence law and evidence procedure, there is another important distinction I need you to make. And that is, what is the, arbit what is the court or the tribunal you're dealing with? Because completely different rules apply. And by now, you're probably thinking, I did this course evidence and proof in that I thought you would just tell me one set of laws that applies across every court and every tribunal in Queensland and Commonwealth. And I'm disappointing you by saying that that's not the case. We have these clear distinctions and different rules that apply in all sorts of different ways. Let me just explain that in a bit more detail. If you're dealing with a matter in the district court, which is a criminal law matter, the strict rules of evidence are likely to be applied by the court. In other words, they're going to, the court will be expecting the advocates, counsel for the prosecution, counsel for the defence, to both draw out the relevant material and challenge the material with generally little or no intervention from the court. In other words, it's for the litigants to present the case and do so in accordance with the evidence law 
and evidence procedure. So it's kind of that type of um, regime, say a criminal law case or a civil case in say the district or Supreme Court, which forms the body of the, the basic um, rules that we'll be talking about, but not always. Um, so for example, if we're dealing with a matter which involves providing evidence and proof in the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, or the Federal Circuit Court, for example, um, or the Planning and Environment Court, somewhat different rules apply because of a section in those pieces of legislation that give power to those tribunals and courts, which basically says that the court or the tribunal may inform itself in whichever way it sees fit. Now, you've got to look out for that because what that says is that while we don't throw evidence law out the, at the window, there is this overriding obligation or power on the court or the tribunal to inform itself in ways that are not strictly subject to the rules of evidence. So, for example, if I'm hearing a guardianship matter in the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, I might allow hearsay evidence in. Or it, the proceedings may become quite inquisitorial as opposed to adversarial in that as the arbiter of fact, I start to directly ask questions uh, and become much more involved in the proceedings. So all these rules that we're talking about, bear in mind they apply in most but not all jurisdictions. And you've got to be careful to ensure that that jurisdiction doesn't have this overriding, it can inform itself in whichever way it sees fit type um, object, object or, or power. I hope that makes sense. So, so far I've succeeded perhaps in confusing you more than providing you with answers. I apologize for that. We will try to rectify that as we progress. But while I'm on a roll of confusing you, let's go in a bit further. Introduction to law days. In introduction to law, you taught about the basic distinction that applies between criminal law and civil law in relation to primarily issues to do with the burden and standard of proof. Do you remember that? Okay. And I know if I ask you the question, I know I can almost guarantee your response. Because if I said to you, what is the standard of proof in criminal law matters? You would say, beyond reasonable doubt, I'm onto that one. And if I said, what's the standard of proof in civil matters? You'd probably say on the balance of probabilities. What's more likely than not? You'd say, we've nailed this. Because we've known that from introduction to law and that's exactly what it is. Now you come to evidence and I'm gonna say, that's a great answer for introduction to law, but it won't get you very far in an evidence exam. Because one thing we didn't tell you is it's actually more complicated than that. So now during evidence and proof, we're gonna talk about the way in which that very simple concept of the burden standard of proof is actually more complicated than you ever thought it was. It's not impossible, but it's just more complicated. So let me explain in a bit more detail what I mean by that. Let's talk about criminal law cases first. We know that when it comes to a criminal law case, the burden is on prosecution to prove its case. The general rule is, and I say general rule because you thought it was the only rule, but it's the general rule, is that um, defence need not prove anything. And that's, that's kind of right, almost all the time. So prosecutor brings a, a, a charge against a person suggesting that they stole an item and they charge uh, as criminal matter, um, the defence is entitled to say, I'm not saying anything, I'm not leading any evidence, I'm not giving any evidence, I just want you to prove it. They can do that. So in that instance, the, the burden of proof is on prosecution, the standard of proof is on prosecution to prove the case based on evidence that it leads beyond reasonable doubt. That's kind of the simple answer. But it's a little more complicated than that in the sense that it's not always the burden of, or the standard of proof 
is not always beyond reasonable doubt, despite that being what you thought. There are a couple of different rules here. The first rule is that in a criminal law case, we tend to think of it as a contested case, but it might be a sentence. A sentence is a plea of guilty. So the criminal law case that we're talking about might be a sentence hearing, not a trial. And in a sentence hearing, prosecution and defence both have an opportunity to try to prove things. They don't have, prosecution doesn't have to prove it beyond reasonable doubt. Um, when making submissions in terms of the facts upon which the defendant is being, or the accused is being sentenced. And likewise, it's usual for defence counsel to stand and make submissions in mitigation. And they essentially they have to prove things, but not beyond reasonable doubt. So different rules apply when it's a sentence hearing. And also in the context of criminal proceedings, different rules apply when it comes to a committal. So if you've done crime, you'll be aware that for an indictable offence that is not dealt with summarily, if it's dealt with in a higher court, almost always it will go through a committal process. What does the prosecution have to prove at a committal? They don't have to prove guilt beyond reasonable doubt. They just have to meet the prima facie test which is that essentially a properly instructed jury may find the accused guilty. That's the test that applies in criminal proceedings where the prosecution has to prove the case, but they only have to do so to the prima facie level. So you can already see that even within the context of criminal law, it's not always beyond reasonable doubt. Now within a trial, it's even a little more complex than that in this sense. And this is where we get to the distinction between the legal burden and the evidential burden. You may have read about those things. So here's how it works. In a criminal case, the onus is on prosecution to prove guilt beyond reasonable doubt. Let's say the case relates to a stabbing, a wounding. Oh, sorry, let, let's say it relates to assault occasioning bodily harm. Um, and the allegation by uh, the, the evidence put forward by prosecution is that the defendant, the accused, struck a person, the victim, and caused them bodily harm. Now, the defence may say, yes, that happened, um, but there was provocation or it was self-defence. Now, once defence raise that doubt to the extent that it is reasonable or it puts reasonable doubt in the mind of the arbiter of fact, then it goes back to prosecution to prove that that defence does not apply and they have to prove that beyond reasonable doubt. But you see that middle bit where defence try to establish something? That's what we call in that context, that's what we call the evidential burden. So it's not up to the prosecutor to say, this person is guilty of assault occasioning bodily harm because they struck that person and there was no self-defence or there was no provocation, it's up to defence to raise those issues of provocation or self-defence when they have the evidential burden to do so. But all they have to do is prove it to a point where it puts a reasonable doubt in the mind of the person or the jury, and then it goes back to the prosecution to establish beyond reasonable doubt. Does that make sense? I hope it does. I hope it does. Yes, so is that the same as in um, like insanity, like for reason of insanity or that yes. the defence would have to um, prove that? Yeah, that's a, that's a bit different. Um, that's one of the exceptions to that sort of general evidential rule. When it comes to insanity, firstly, it's usually dealt with in the mental health court, but there is now power under the Mental Health Act 2016 for that to be dealt with in a magistrate's court as well. Um, but the defence needs to establish the insanity on the balance of probabilities. So whether it's more likely than not, um, it's not a mere evidential burden in the sense that I was talking about with provocation or self-defence. But that's a really good distinction, really good question, Tegan. Thank you. Okay, so what we've discussed so far is that there are a number of distinctions that you need to consider. This is why I think you need your toolkit, something that works for you. 
we've talked about common law versus statute. We've talked about Queensland versus Commonwealth um, or the Uniform Evidence Act. We've talked about different courts and different tribunals having different ways that uh, information is extracted. We've talked about evidence being that which is relevant and admissible. And we've kind of talked about proof as being that evidence which is into the court and is it reliable and is it of probative value. Um, we've talked about information and we've tried to break that down into facts and opinions, but it's all information. And we tried to uh, indicate that only part of that is actual admissible evidence. I will just say another thing, and that is facts, as another distinction, are either known facts or unknown facts. So we may know that there is a fact out in existence, but we don't know what it is. Does that make sense? I'm getting, I'm almost becoming scientific now. Um, this is almost becoming, whoa. Right, Harold Holt died, we think is a fact. I mean, some people say, Harold Holt didn't die in the surf. Uh, and we all know who Harold Holt is, and we know that it's said that he died in the surf when he was surfing as Prime Minister. So Harold Holt died, we know that, but we don't know as a fact how he died. I mean, we think that Harold Holt died and his body was never found. But some people say that Russian submarines came and collected him. But whatever it is, the, there is a fact out there. It's just that we don't know the fact. So facts are either known or they're unknown. Um, so, you know, there is that distinction as well. So I want you to start thinking about these distinctions and drawing up some charts, some flow charts and some other material for you as you read the material that uh, you have. And that's probably all that I've, I'll burden you with tonight. You've been very patient. Thank you very much. Are there any questions before we wrap up for this evening? Um, I just have one question. When I was watching um, the um, the lecture, um, it was talking about the book, The Cross on Evidence. Is that something that you would suggest that we get that would benefit us? I think, yeah, Cross on Evidence is a really good book. Um, actually, you've raised a good point, something I wanted to do. So Cross on Evidence is almost a Bible. It's very good. I actually find field easier to read. So that's our prescribed text. This is the fourth edition. If you don't have the fourth, if you have the third, it'll serve you well. That's the fourth edition. Cross is very, very good. It's very authoritative. I just find it a bit harder to read than field. Um, other textbooks that you could consider, and you may be able to access through the university library. This is by John Forbes, uh, Evidence Law in Queensland. That's really good too. Uh, I use that quite often. And of course, there is the supplementary text, which is Rules of Evidence in Australia, which is more text and cases. So that's worth having a look at. And finally, this one I really like. It's um, Evidence Law in Queensland, South Australia and Western Australia. These are the states that are non-uniform evidence states. Um, and that's, that's a good one too. Uh, that one is by Thomson Reuters. So some of the others are by Lexus Nexus. But cross on evidence is really good. Um, do you know if we can access it through the university library? Not sure? Okay. I take it that you're both well aware of how to use the library resources. Um, I prepared some um, material in relation to research as well. There's a series of four short videos. I think I've posted them online in the um, other materials. So if you need a, a refresher on legal research, that, that might be something worth having a look at as well. So that's a good question, Tegan. Any other questions, comments? Thank you very much for your patience tonight. We'll end the session now. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. And if there are any questions, please ask through UCREW, assuming that we can get UCREW up and running. And um, just give it another test. Please send me an email if there are ongoing problems and we'll try and sort it out. All the best. Thank you. Bye.